Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Angela, and this is Transfiguration Sunday, the Sunday where we uh, remember how Jesus went up the mountain and the glory of God was shown in him. It's also the Sunday before we start our Lenten season as we prepare for Easter. So we hope that this will be a day where you experience the glory of God in your life, that you're encouraged, and that you're filled with a sense of hope as we uh, look towards Lent and Easter in the future. So many things happening in the life of the church. Uh, Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday, and we will have the imposition of ashes at noon if you would like to come by uh, in, the, in the education building in the chapel on the first floor. And also at 5.30, we will have an Ash Wednesday service. Also, the following, hmm, I'm already forgetting, uh, the Super Bowl is this Sunday. So come to the Super Bowl if you would like at our at the Parsonage. Uh, you can uh, email us uh, if you would like the address and or call the church office if you like the address of the Parsonage. We'll start at three, bring a snack. Even if you don't watch football, come by. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. The following week, uh, then we're gonna start our Lenten study on February 21st. There's gonna be two opportunities, and let me tell you first what it is. It's a six-week Lenten study from the book, Entering the Passion of Jesus by Amy Jill Levine. Uh, she's a Jewish New Testament scholar who will help us understand the context of Jesus from the Jewish Hebrew perspective. I'm so excited about this study. We are starting February 21st. There's gonna be two opportunities on Wednesday, one at 10 a.m. here on our campus in the education building and one at 7 p.m. on Zoom. This is on February 21st. I hope that you get a chance to come to some of these events. If you are long distance, uh, God bless you. And uh, we'll continue to pray for all the people that are watching as well. Take care. Today's scripture reading is Gospel of Mark, chapter nine, verses two to nine. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth can brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they look around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to Transfiguration Sunday in our sermon series called Becoming the People of God, Part 5. The sermon today is called Shining Through, and I will pray us into this time. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord God, you who are rock and our redeemer. Spirit, give us ears to hear you, open our hearts so that we can receive you, so we can become like you. In Christ we pray, amen. So in our scripture this morning, we have talk about laundry. And because, uh, because of this, I wanna help us set an image of this. And I'm gonna do some laundry humor for us to start us off, why not? Here we go. How much fun is washing your clothes? Loads. What happened to the leopard that fell into the washing machine? He came out spotless. <laughs> 
What did one sock say to the other sock in the dryer? I'll see you next time around. What did the child do when she saw her dad fall over with the laundry? She watched it all unfold. And here's the last one for us this morning. What kind of jokes does the laundry like? Dry humor. Hmm, get it? Dry cleaning. So we know from the scripture that Jesus shone bright, that his clothes were so bright that it was brighter than any bleach at that time. And that in the brightness, the people at that time, the disciples, they were able to see the glory of God, the glory of who Christ was in Jesus. They were in awe and they were terrified. They were so much in awe that they were terrified. But that glory that they, sh they uh, experienced on the mountain really was a summation of the glimpses of glory that Jesus shone throughout his whole ministry at that point. Every time he healed a child, every time he fed hungry people, every time he cast out a, a demon, any and every activity of grace and love was a glimpse of glory, a glimpse of brightness in people's lives. And this morning, we're going to talk about the transfiguration, but I want to highlight here that this glory that they experienced on the mountaintop, this glory was something that was given to them every single day in their ministry, and that Jesus came down the mountain with them so that they can extend that beauty, that glory, that light to the people around them. With no judgment, uh, it was an open kind of grace extended to all people, regardless of how worthy people were, regardless of how clean they were, Jesus gave them grace, gave them that brightness in their life. All right, so let's jump right into our story about the transfiguration in Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. I invite you at home to grab a Bible as I uh, give you a little bit of a context here. Now, this story is very similar to an Old Testament story about Moses going up Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. And I'm gonna highlight some of the similarities here so that you can understand that this Jesus mimicked this great prophet uh, Moses. All right, so we have the same opening, this idea of the six days later. We have three companions going up on the mountain, both in uh, the Moses story and the Jesus story. We have the shining bright, the face, the clothes that were bright. We have the fear that uh, both the disciples and uh, the company of Moses that they experience with this glory. And the most important part here is the voice of God that came to Moses as he wrote down the commandments, uh, the voice of God, the commandments of God, and the voice of God that came to Jesus giving him the authority to speak and to heal and to, and to bring that brightness and glory to humanity. All right, let's jump right in. Verse two, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. And so these three folks are known to be a part of Jesus's inner circle and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. There was nobody else there, there's no crowd. Uh, there were no other disciples, just the three of them and Jesus, and he was transfigured before them. Now, this is really hard to understand exactly what this means, but for whatever reason, the, the disciples, whatever they saw of Jesus, that they saw him looking differently. How so? It says, uh, it explains here in verse 3, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. So there was a radiance, there was a light that kind of radiated from Jesus. And he just appeared differently, glorious. The word glory is both light and, and mag, um, it gives it a magnitude. A magni uh, Jesus was magnificent. And verse four, and there appeared to them 
Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. So here's uh, the two great prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Moses. Both were led up a mountain, both heard God, both uh, gave instruction uh, to a community to stay faithful, to stay connected to God, to not forget God's ways. And so Elijah, Moses, and Jesus are all kind of hanging out here in this glorious moment. In verse 5, then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, he interrupts this glory, and he's like, teacher, teacher, it is good for us to be here. He acknowledges how glorious, how important this moment was. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now this word here, dwellings, in the Greek is skines, which means tent. It kind of uh, is connected to the celebration where they put tents or uh, booths up to celebrate um, um, this f a specific festival in the Old Testament. And here there's an indication that Peter wanted to commemorate this moment, to celebrate this moment. And these tents could have also been a way to create an altar to uh, memorialize this event, that it was that important, that it was that good for Peter to be a part of this moment. And it explains here in verse 6 the reason why he even mentions this. Uh, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. This idea that he was so nervous or so anxious, that this moment was so momentous, that he didn't know what to do with himself except to celebrate Christ and to celebrate the moment. Verse 7, Then a cloud overshadowed them, which is an indication that the holy ness of God or the essence of the presence of the holy has come down on earth in some way. And from the cloud there came a voice. This must have been absolutely terrifying. And the voice said this, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. So we have heard these words before in the baptism of Jesus. We hear him again here, the authority that God has given Jesus to extend this goodness to the world, to share to the world basically that his words are important, that he will lead people to God, that he will lead people to love, to listen to him, that he has something to offer. Verse nine, oh no, verse eight, suddenly when they looked around, so after this cloud and this voice, suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. The cow lifted, the vision of the others uh, were gone, and it was just Jesus in them. He had returned back to being the Jesus they knew, the friend they knew, the rabbi they knew, the man that they had listened to and followed and ate with and struggled with in their time of ministry. In verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them, to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead, letting them know that Jesus is still coming with them. They're taking the glory that they experience with them in Jesus. Um, and not to share information sometimes that people, other people might not understand until they do understand, you know, until they have an awakening themselves or an aha moment themselves or, then you're able to say, oh, that was the glory of God what you experienced, and I too have experienced something like this. We can experience this glory, not just on the mountaintop, but in the mundane, in the everyday. We see glimpses of God's glory all around us. When I was in my early 20s, I spent a lot of time volunteering and helping folks. I, volunteered with this uh, ministry called the Dream Center in LA for a couple months, uh, actually a couple years. And they would go to neighborhoods with food in LA, boxes of food, especially during Thanksgiving, and would give people food. And they would also have this children's program where they would uh, take buses in this neighborhood where kids were 
just kind of running around in the streets and didn't have a lot of supervision and a lot of help or a lot of support. And they would invite these kids. They would bust them in into children's programs at the Dream Center in LA. And so I was a part of that program as well. And there was this one time in the middle of a children's program, I was sitting towards the back. Uh, there was like a puppet show in the front and there was candy and it was just really animated and uh, it was beautiful. Uh, there was a young little girl towards the end and I noticed her because she was kind of having a hard time settling down. She uh, was extremely dirty, like the clothes on her seemed like she had rolled in mud. I can see like the grime on her face and as if she lived in a third world country. I could not, I could not understand why this girl was so dirty. That, uh, that she didn't have the care and the supervision to provide clean clothes for her, care for her, to bathe her. And she was crying at this point. She was kind of uh, having a really difficult time engaging with the other kids, probably because she wasn't socialized or didn't have enough resources um, in her life to help her engage. And she was sitting kind of towards the back and I saw her while she was whining and for one moment she looked up and her eyes just met and I could see the pain in her eyes but also like the cry for help and also the beauty in this child these piercing eyes that kind of connected with mine and in that moment, I just could sense that we had made this connection. It was like this holy moment. She was three years old and I got down really low and I pointed to her and I waved and I said, come here. I wait for her to come over. And in that moment, which seemed like it happened instantly and yet it was somewhat like in slow motion, she comes over to me, the stranger. She's never met before, but she came over and I could smell the stench on her body, like the girl has not been bathed for a while. And I just wrapped her up in my arms and I put her on my lap. And I told her, I told her, it's okay. You're safe. God loves you. And in that moment, with this dirty little girl on my lap, it felt like I was experiencing a, a taste of the glory of God the taste of God's love, that it was a blessing to me, not just a blessing for her, but a blessing for me. That in that moment, it was this beautiful, holy moment, holiness in the mundane. Frederick Buchner, in his book, Whistling in the Dark, he's written many books, uh, says this about the transfiguration. In the transfiguration, it was the holiness of Jesus shining through his humanness, his face so afire with it that they were almost blinded. Even with us, something like that happens once in a while. The face of a man walking his child in the park, of a woman picking peas in the garden, of sometimes even the unlikeliest person listening to a concert, say, or standing barefoot in the sand watching the waves roll in, or just having a beer at a Saturday baseball game in July. Every once and so often, something so touching, so incandescent, so alive, transfigures the human face that it's almost beyond bearing. Sometimes we think that the holy is only in the church or only when there's spiritual practices or only when things are clean, but that's not who Jesus is. You see, Jesus, even though he was transfigured and glorious on the mountain, he was still glorious among the people. He went and touched dirty people all the time, unclean people, people that had diseases all the time. He extended that glory, that love, that grace. He recognized the divine in people and extended grace to them, honored them, honored the divine in them. 
My invitation for us is to be that kind of people, that kind of people who are not so judgmental that we cannot see the glory, even in something that appears dirty to us. That maybe God is doing something, redeeming something, bringing love and hope in a situation that on the outside may seem overwhelming and not fitting. But see, glory is not something that we can control. You see, glory, the brightness of God's love, that can be something that we experience, but it's happening. That God's presence is all around us all the time, extending that grace. We either have the opportunity to bear witness to it, to participate in it, or to pull away and not go up the mountain and not experience the glory and the grace of Christ. My invitation for you and for me is to stay open, to witness glory, to engage, to touch the dirty child. Our hearts may be, in fact, blessed by doing so. Let us pray. Holy One, you came down here in this dirty world to touch us, to love us, that you do not call us dirty. And even in the mundane, the holy shows up, the glory shows up. Help us be a people who are open so that we can see, see your love, see your grace, participate in it, engage it, not be afraid to bring that healing to the world, the taste of your love to the world. Just like teach it, Jesus, who touched those who were sick, who took the glory that he had and used it for ministry, for the work, to saving the world in practical and in spiritual ways. Let us do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We give back to God our prayer, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Our lives, we continue to give back to God. As God engages us, we continue to give. If you would like to give to the church, and we thank you for your donation and generosity, you can do so by going to our website at glendalefirst.org. God bless you. Let us now receive the benediction, the blessing for today. May you come to know this glory of God in you and may this glory of God be depicted through you. May your eyes be open so that you can see the glimpses of the glory of God in the mundane, in the everyday, in the regular typical things in our lives. And may we have the strength, the audacity even to engage, engage that glory by extending grace and love and care in the simple ways that we do. That's how we participate in the glory of God in this world. May we be a people of peace. May we go out into the world with peace. Amen.